Hello and welcome to another Maine Historical Society virtual program. I'm Kathleen Newman. It is April 13th, 2022, and this is Dress Codes with Richard Thompson Ford. Richard Thompson Ford is a professor of law at Stanford Law School. He writes about law, social and cultural issues, and race relations, and has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, CNN, and Slate. He is the author of the New York Times notable books, The Race Card and Rights Gone Wrong, How Law Corrupts the Struggle for Equality. He has appeared on The Colbert Report, The Rachel Maddow Show, and The Dylan Radigan Show. He is a member of the American American Law Institute and serves on the board of the Authors Guild Foundation. His most recent book is Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Made History. And so he joins us tonight to talk about that topic as part of our series uh, for our Northern Threads 200 Years of Clothing at Maine Historical Society uh, exhibit. And Professor Ford, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you and thank you to, to the Maine Historical Society for inviting me to give this talk and to everyone who's joined us tonight. Um, I'd like to start by sharing my screen and as I, um, because this is a very much a visual uh, book as well as a, um, a historical one and an analytical one. So that's an image of the cover of the book. That's actually Louis the Fourteenth, and I can talk a little bit more about him and why that image is on the cover later. But I'd like to begin with uh, a controversy, a legal controversy that um, happened in 1565 in the city of London. Uh, Richard Wallen was arrested on the streets of London for wearing what the authorities described as a great and monstrous, outrageous pair of trunk hose. Now, trunk hose, for those of you who don't have a pair of these in your closet, are these puffy kinds of um, thigh or knee length trousers. You might associate them with William Shakespeare or Sir Walter Raleigh, and they were all the rage in men's fashion in Tudor era England, but they could get you into trouble. Wallen, for his crime of fashion, had his clothing seized by the authorities and exhibited in a public place as, I quote, an example of extreme folly. And another unfortunate man was arrested for wearing trunk hose in London, and his punishment was even more severe. He had his clothing cut by the authorities and the linings pulled out. And so these trunk hose were stuffed with linings, various silks, and they could be kind of puffed up to look even more grand and flamboyant. But um, this poor character had his um, linings cut and pulled out. And then with the silk linings dragging behind him, he was marched through the streets of the city to his place of residence where any other offending garments were also seized by the authorities and likewise cut once again, as an example to all of the dangers of frivolous and forbidden fashions. Now, the laws that prohibited this kind of fashion were not unique to Tudor era England. In fact, the fashion police were hard at work up and down the peninsula, or excuse me, um, all over Europe, up and down the Italian peninsula and um, in the free cities of Italy and in, um, France and Spain, um, Germany, many countries had a variety of laws regulating what people could wear. Uh, these laws were multiplying in number from the period about the late 1300s through the 1600s. Uh, governments were passing more and more and more laws in order um, to sort of keep up with changing fashions and ensure that people weren't wearing things that the authorities considered to be inappropriate. Um, so they, they, they were passed at an accelerating pace as if the authorities were desperate uh, to keep up with changing fashions. And indeed, at one point in the late 1500s, the Venetian Senate simply passed a law that said, all new fashions are hereby banned. Now, you may be thinking, what's at stake here? What, what was going on 
that would encourage authorities to regulate something like clothing. And what a strange thing it is. Thank goodness we don't do anything like that today in our more modern and enlightened era. But in fact, we do. I'm a law professor and in my research studying civil rights and um, freedom of expression, I found a series of laws regulating what people wear. People can be kept home from school. They're kept off of public conveyances. They're fired from their jobs. Um, sometimes they're even jailed simply because of what they're wearing. A couple of examples, a um, high school student named Stephanie Dunn was sent home from uh, school just a few years ago for wearing a scandalously revealing top that showed her collarbones. Um, and a young man was actually sent to jail for wearing sagging pants, these kind of pants that are worn sort of low but, but around, the, um, around the hips um, style that's often associated with hip hop and rap music. Um, he was sentenced uh, to jail for contempt of court. And the judge at the time said, you are in contempt of court because you showed your butt in court. Um, and people also lose their jobs for their hairstyles, um, for wearing makeup or not wearing makeup. Uh, we regulate clothing to a surprising degree today, just as they did in past eras. And so in my work as a law professor, I wanted to try to find out what was going on, why we care so much about what people wear, why employers are willing to lose otherwise valued employees, why schools are willing to send kids home from school and thereby impede their learning. And conversely, why people are willing to risk losing their jobs or risk getting sent home from school or kept off of an airplane um, or even fined in some cities for their choice of clothing. What's at stake? And in trying to determine this, I found myself going further and further back to history, to the time of Richard Wallman and the overstuffed trunk hose. And this was an era in history when not only were there more laws about what people could wear, but the authorities were much more explicit about why they passed those laws. And what I discovered was that clothing at this period of time in history was understood to be a type of social credential. People were identified according to their occupation and according to their social status and social class by what they wore. This was an era in which much of the population was illiterate and clothing became a kind of political manifesto as well as a symbol of social status. And so it was very important that everyone wore the type of clothing that was associated with their status, with their position in society, with their occupation, with their religion, and with their gender. And the authorities passed multiple laws regulating clothing. Queen Elizabeth, for instance, Queen Elizabeth I was a master of fashion and she used fashion as a mode of statescraft. Public figures at the time commented on the magnificence of her dress. And it was as if Queen Elizabeth through the power of fashion presented herself as an almost otherworldly figure. And that image, that spectacle allowed her the authority to rule. So her political power was inseparable from her attire. Now, therefore, it simply would not do for commoners or members of the lower orders to wear similar clothing. And so Queen Elizabeth passed a series of what were described as acts of apparel and royal proclamations regulating what people could wear. Guards were posted at the gates of cities with a list of people according to their social status uh, and um, prepared to stop and arrest people who were wearing clothing that wasn't appropriate. And the laws in question explicitly like, regulated attire by social status. So they would say things like, only someone of the rank of a knight of the garter or greater would be allowed to wear, let's say, crimson silk or a certain type of velvet. Uh, 
And so these laws also would often be quite upfront about why they were regulating this clothing. So for, for instance, one of the acts of apparel explicitly said, in order to ensure that people are recognized and respected according to their titles, eminences and degrees, um, we passed this law in order to ensure um, that clothing is worn only by the appropriate types of people. Now, um, so there was a great concern about social upstarts dressing above their condition and kind of passing themselves off as people who they weren't. Fast fraud by fashion was an overarching consideration. Um, and this wasn't just true in England. Again, uh, in Florence, the Florentine patriarch Cosimo de' Medici once remarked, one can make a gentleman with two yards of red silk, thereby expressing this anxiety about people using fashion in order to inappropriately, in the minds of the established elites, inappropriately climb the social ladder. And I'd suggest that there might be even a more insidious form of, of, of concern. Because it wasn't just that people like Richard Wallen of the overstuffed trunk hose were trying to pass themselves off as members of the aristocracy or the nobility. But it was also, and perhaps even more dangerously, that they were using the power of fashion in order to assert their own importance as members of an emergent and recently wealthy merchant class or class of skilled tradespeople. This was a period of time in which the economy was booming and new wealth was being created everywhere. And so skilled tradespeople, merchants, um, and other members of the what, what have been considered the common classes were earning enough money to dress in the same manner as the nobility and the elite. And they did so not only in order to, um, or not necessarily, excuse me, in order to trick people into thinking they were members of the nobility, but in order to assert the importance of a new and emergent and newly powerful um, um, bourgeois class. And this may have been most threatening of all to the authorities. So one aspect of the regulation of clothing had to do with this anxiety about social status and social position. And I'd argue that this is still true to some extent today. I'll, I'll return to that theme in a moment. Now, another anxiety uh, involved questions of gender. And I'd like to turn to those questions now. Um, one thing that's important to note is that for hundreds of years, since from let's say the 1300s, it, in a moment that some historians describe as the birth of fashion, um, through about the 1700s, the most flashy, the most flamboyant, the sexiest fashions were men's fashions, not women's. Um, men's fashions were on the cutting edge and women tended to follow, particularly daring women would uh, adopt various aspects of masculine fashion. And that could be seen as quite scandalous. But the most um, flashy and flamboyant fashions were reserved for men. And this included many things that we now associate exclusively with femininity. Things like lace, um, brocade, jewelry, and even makeup. This is a picture of a noble of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and he was said, to dust himself with powder or to require actually four flunkies, it was described, to dust himself with powder. He carried eyelash curler and um, rouge blush um, onto the field of battle. Um, so this was the height of masculine fashion in the early 1700s. And all of the flamboyance was a way of demonstrating one's magnificence and social position. This is what an elite man looked like in 1750. Now, just about half a century later, um, this becomes the height of masculine elite fashion. Um, a big change occurs. This is a portrait of Beau Brummel, who is often um, thought of as sort of an exemplar of masculine vanity. Now, what we, he was really known for at the time was the understated nature of his dress. 
There was no adornment. There was no brocade. There were no jewels. Everything was about subtlety and refinement. And so this became a new type of masculine uh, power dressing in the period, in the early 1800s. So in just about 50 years, we go from this to this. It's a moment that some historians had described as the great masculine renunciation. Because men, and only men, this is important, only men renounced um, flamboyance, opulence, luxurious display in favor of what was understood to be streamlined, sober, practical clothing. And this reflected a change in political sensibilities, a change in political philosophies. It was a shift from a time um, of societies dominated by aristocracies and privilege of birth to during the enlightenment and after societies where industriousness and rationality and practicality were, and to some extent equality were valued. When this type of clothing emerged, which became the prototype, if you will, for the three-piece business suit, um, when this type of clothing emerged, we had a, a period of time in which people began to question and rebel against established hierarchies. And so this clothing became synonymous with a particular type of political sensibility. Here's an example of, a, uh, of this phenomenon. Now, this is um, a quote from an English gentleman who was beginning to dress something like this. Um, and because the great masculine renunciation took place at slightly different times in different parts of Europe, um, England had already executed its absolute monarch or the person who positioned himself as an absolute monarch, Charles I, whereas um, the absolute monarchy in France was still alive and therefore a lot of the opulence of dress and display was still very much in place in France. And so this English gentleman uh, was crossing the English Channel and he was going to France. Um, and when he went to France, he had to wear the elaborate courtly dress that was associated with elite status in that country, um, whereas England had already gone through the great masculine renunciation. And here's what he said about what he had to wear. He said, I felt so constrained as if I had been thrown into the Bastille and I longed for my light little frock coat. And that's this coat that um, you see here. Uh, my light little frock coat, for it places a man under no great constraint but allows him to do as he pleases, much as our glorious constitution. So in that one phrase, he's tied clothing and fashion to political ideologies and political ideals. And as the great masculine renunciation and of course, the ideals of enlightenment spread, this type of clothing became associated with elite status and this type of clothing was out of fashion, anachronistic, um, and even dangerous to be worn. Uh, so this was the way that we communicated the values of the Enlightenment through this type of refined, um, streamlined, sober clothing for men. For women, on the other hand, this change did not take place. In fact, as men's clothing was getting ever more streamlined, sober, dark colors, um, and uh, arguably practical, women's clothing was getting ever more elaborate, adorned, and cumbersome. It was almost as if their clothing was designed to prevent them from occupying positions of authority or respect. And it communicated um, frivolity, vanity, and um, a certain type of self-regard that was not considered appropriate for someone who might exercise power. So there, this, the very symbolism of men's and women's clothing was enforcing a gender hierarchy. And I want us to notice that this wasn't as true in the past. Certainly there were gender hierarchies in Tudor era England. But the type of clothing that men and women wore had a certain similarity. They, they spoke in a similar language, if you will, um, although in different accents, let's say. 
Um, but by the time of the great masculine re renunciation, there, it's a very, very different symbolic language that men and women are speaking in their clothing. And this makes it hard for women to um, advance and to claim positions of authority. And feminists noticed this. Now, of course, the, the clothing is also just physically cumbersome. This is a picture of the cage crinoline, which was a kind of steel cage over which um, the skirts were draped. And as you can see, people made fun of it. Here you have a woman who's hiding her adulterous suitor underneath the crinoline. There were all sorts of jokes about women hiding contraband under their crinolines. And um, indeed, crinolines um, were actually somewhat dangerous. There was an epidemic of cr uh, crinoline fires where people would brush up against a, an active fireplace with their skirts. And because uh, the, the, there was a lot of air underneath, this was held up by a steel cage, um, they would very easily catch on fire. And there were some tragic incidents around crinoline fires. So feminists began to um, protest and to argue for dress reform movements. And these movements were at first quite unsuccessful. Uh, many of you may know the name Amelia Bloomer, who was one of the advocates of a reform in women's dress. And she actually devised a form of women's pants that uh, became known as bloomers. They were popular for about six months and then they, man they were ridiculed out of existence. So women were struggling for a reform in dress to get more practical clothing and also to get more clothing that was uh, more likely to command respect. It took a long time for them to do that. Uh, a woman wearing pants up until the early 20th century was scandalous and women could be arrested for wearing pants for public indecency. Um, women wearing men's trousers were considered to be a kind of sexual fetish. It was as if by wearing women, men's clothing, women were insisting on some of the prerogatives and the freedom of men. And that had an erotic charge, which turned pants, women wearing pants into a sexual fetish. But it was also seen, of course, as quite threatening to the public order. And so many cities had laws prohibiting women from wearing pants. And again, they could be arrested for wearing them. This is an image of um, you know, a kind of risque magazine. And the title here is Bifurcated Girls. So a woman wearing pants was described as a bifurcated woman. She was cut in, in half. Um, and that act of wearing clothing that even suggested a woman's legs, and these aren't tight pants, they're not see-through pants, they're just men's pants, um, but that act alone was seen as quite scandalous. Now, when did things change for women? Well, ironically, they changed with a movement that we don't typically associate with feminism or social activism. They changed with the flappers. It was flapper fashions that achieved the first glimpses of what we might describe as a great feminine renunciation of adornment and elaborate cumbersome clothing. Now we have clothing that's streamlined and modern, very much like men's clothing that um, had, had achieved um, in the early 1800s. The flappers, we may often associate with frivolity and um, vanity, you know, someone like Daisy Buchanan in The Great Gatsby. But in fact, the flappers were a, uh, often they were working class women. They were a racially diverse group of women. They were women who were um, working sometimes in, the, in factories during World War I. They were women who were seeking political emancipation. They were suffragettes and their clothing reflected their desire to move into the modern world and to claim indeed some of the prerogatives and freedoms that typically had been reserved to men. Flapper fashions were quite scandalous at the time and they were often banned. Employers passed laws prohibiting bobbed hair, prohibiting the kind of skirts that um, stopped just below the knee. Um, people invade against this clothing and interestingly enough, they had two complaints. Some people said that the clothing was um, too masculine and that any woman wearing this type of ugly masculine clothing would never find a mate. Whereas other people argued that the clothing was too sexy, that it suggested the female form underneath um, and therefore would invite sexual assault. 
um, and lewd behavior on the part of men for which the women would, should be held responsible for wearing such terrible clothing. Um, nevertheless, because it was fashionable, it caught on across social classes. It started with the working classes, but it kind of trickled up, if you will, to the elites and it stuck. And so this was the first moment of real reform in women's clothing. Laws and dress codes around clothing also had relevance for race. And um, so this is a picture of people marching on Washington for civil rights. It's the famous march for jobs and freedom. And you'll notice that they're all wearing suits and ties. People wore their Sunday best to protest racial injustice, whether they were marching or sitting in at segregated lunch counters, they were wearing their Sunday best. And we might wonder why, it's kind of impractical. You're outside in the hot sun. If you're sitting in at a lunch counter, you're likely to be attacked by racist mobs. Um, why would you wear your nicest clothing? Uh, and today, some people argue, well, they were wearing that clothing in order to kind of ingratiate themselves or to um, you know, suck up to the mainstream. Um, to you, you beg for inclusion. But that's not what was going on here at all. And in order to understand the real symbolism and the real importance of this attire, we need to go back in history, back to a period of time in which African-Americans were forbidden by law from wearing refined clothing. In 1740, in South Carolina, there was a law called the Negro Act. And this act, forbade Negroes and slaves from wearing refined attire. Much like the laws of Tudor era England, it assigned to, according to social status, clothing that was considered to be appropriate and uh, African-Americans were assigned the coarsest and most unrefined workwear as the only clothing that they were allowed by law to wear. And these laws, entitled white citizens to actually stop well-dressed African-Americans and seize their clothing and take it for their own use. There was lots of anxiety about well-dressed African-Americans at the time because there were a significant number of well-dressed African-Americans, both slaves and free. And the concern, just as in Tudor era England, was that the symbolism that, of that clothing was a threat to social hierarchy that to see an African-American in the refined attire reserved for the elite would suggest that African-Americans might deserve the kind of respect that only the elite could command. And this was threatening. And so for centuries, people protested against and even were violent toward African-Americans who were well-dressed. Uh, racist mobs would attack well-dressed African-Americans for being uppity or not knowing their place. African-American servicemen coming back from World War I were sometimes attacked on the platform of the trains as they stepped off wearing their dress uniforms for um, putting on airs. And popular newspapers ridiculed African-Americans for wearing the latest fashions as if it was ridiculous that these people would, could, um, could wear such clothing. And so when you get to the 1960s and the civil rights movement, wearing their Sunday best wasn't an attempt to ingratiate themselves with the mainstream. It was a defiant demand for respect and authority. It was an important part of the civil rights struggle for that reason. Fashion was part of the message. And indeed, in the early civil rights movement, there was a dress code. People were expected to wear their Sunday best when they went to represent the cause. Now, as things go, that didn't last. Um, a new generation had a different idea about the appropriate styles to be worn when organizing and when protesting. So just two years later, but a younger generation, um, these young men are dressed in workwear. Now, again, though, there was a dress code. They didn't just put on whatever they happened to have available or roll out of bed. They made a deliberate and conscious decision to wear workwear as a statement of solidarity with the people that they were trying to organize, the sharecroppers and the people working in the factories. So here too, dress was important and it made an important political statement in relationship to race and racial liberation. And of course, the Black Panthers 
who develop their own very distinctive style as yet another type of statement. The Black Panthers had a minister of culture and they believed that a distinctive African-American style that included things like uh, uh, natural hair was an indispensable part of the racial liberation project. They, uh, giving rise to things like the Black is Beautiful movement. So again, fashion and clothing are important to political struggles. Now, um, I wanna say a little bit about the present moment and then I'll stop. Because we might think, well, you know, this is all a history lesson and in today's environment, no one really cares about this stuff anymore. We're beyond thinking about fashion. And in fact, um, society is becoming more and more casual all the time. And that's certainly true. I'm here in the Silicon Valley, the heart of casual clothing, where people wear hoodie sweatshirts and gray t-shirts to work on a regular basis. And that might make you think that we're beyond caring about fashion, but here are a couple of examples that might make you think otherwise. Take Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, who is famous for wearing a gray t-shirt. Um, here's what he said about why he wears that gray t-shirt. He said, I wouldn't be doing my job if I, if I spent any of my energy on things that are frivolous, like what to wear. Um, and that's why I wear a gray t-shirt every day. Now, that doesn't sound exactly like somebody who doesn't care about what people are wearing. Instead, it sounds like he's ascribed moral significance to that gray t-shirt. It's a symbol of the work ethic. It's a symbol of his, devo his devotion to the job. And you might imagine that if that's the case, people who do look like they're wasting their time on things that are frivolous, people who dress up or enjoy fashion might be looked down upon. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. So for instance, the tech, entre uh, uh, um, the, the, the tech entrepreneur and, um, named Peter Thiel once said, never invest in a company where the CEO wears a suit. So we've just inverted the dress code. Before you had to wear a suit, now you can't wear a suit. And I can tell you from experience that you don't wanna wear a suit to one of these tech campuses in the Silicon Valley. And here's another example. Um, the CEO of Yahoo, Marissa Mayer, likes fashion and she was photographed for a Vogue fashion shoot wearing some pretty nice fashionable clothing. Um, you know, it's for a fashion magazine. When the magazine came out, the response was harsh. So one person said, she looks like she's relaxing or on vacation while everyone else is working. So just as you might expect, clothing has become a symbol of the work ethic, but now you need to wear the gray t-shirt um, or the hoodie sweatshirt to show that you care about work and not about silly things like fashion. So we still care about fashion even today. And as a consequence, we still have lots of dress codes, both written and unwritten. And the unwritten ones can be just as powerful and just as dangerous and just as damaging as the written ones. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for listening and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. Um, we've got a couple questions coming in already. Um, first question, uh, and the person asking question also comments on just how fascinating this topic is. Um, could usage of clothing for status um, be compared to modern day usage of fashion, such as like famous designers or brands as a form of showcasing socioeconomic status or like, you know, I'm a, I'm a big Hollywood star. Are we talking about essentially kind of the same idea, just a different time period and different types of clothes? I, yes, I think there's a good argument to be made for that. If you think about the, here's, here's the progression with respect to the use of clothing for status. So you have elaborate and fancy clothing, which is very expensive. And right away, that's going to exhibit st status simply because some people can't afford to buy it. Um, when the clothing is cumbersome, 
it exhibits status because if you have to work, you can't afford to wear cumbersome clothing that gets in the way. But over time, this type of thing can be copied, especially if you have um, up and coming social classes that can afford to buy the clothing. So we change to something that's harder to copy, which involves refinement and subtle details and the like. Um, and, but the clothing is still communicating status. It's just that you know, now it's about the cut of the suit or the refinement of the fabric rather than about jewels and, and, and um, the like. Now, today, here's one thing that makes clothing exclusive. It's a trademark. Because if you take a simple polo shirt that doesn't have a polo pony on it, um, that polo shirt can be made, manufactured, and sold for quite a small amount of money. Um, if you put that polo pony on there, suddenly the polo shirt is going to cost you around $100. And that polo pony allows the manufacturer, in this case, Ralph Lauren, to prohibit anyone else from copying it. You can copy the shirt, but you can't copy the polo pony. And so increasingly, these trademarks are a way of ensuring the exclusivity of the goods. When you get into really exclusive goods, things made by companies like um, you know, Louis Vuitton or Hermes, um, the supply is constricted and the trademark becomes an integral part of the design if you think about the, uh, the Louis Vuitton symbols. Mm -hmm. So you cannot copy that bag because the, uh, you know, although you can copy the functional elements, you can't copy the trademarks and that is a, immediately a symbol of how exclusive it is. Um, and sometimes it's also a symbol of who's in the know. So if you take a brand like Hermes where the trademark is relatively subtle, um, only a certain type of person will spot that right away as an expensive handbag. But it turns out they're very expensive in their waiting lists that can be up to 10 years long to get your hands on one of those Hermes purses. So it's a very exclusive um, and very effective status symbol. Interesting. I know someone's um, remembering or sharing a memory in the chat uh, in 1971, um, how she was almost expelled from high school because she was wearing slacks that were deemed by the principal as, quote, too distracting for the boys. Mm -hmm. And I can remember in the 1990s, you know, having similar issues with with friends and classmates and um, a lot of us feeling that the dress codes in the school were were skewed to be a lot harsher on girls and female fashions. And I, I imagine, I, I can't speak for teenagers in high school today, but I, I think that may still be the case. So do you notice whether it's like laws on the books or just, you know, dress codes in general, sort of a skewing or it's certainly easier for people with a much more privileged perspective or privileged place in society to get away with things? Is there definitely more of a, a tendency to punish or to point out uh, the wrong things or the rule, rule breaking that women are doing or that people of color are doing or minorities are doing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, and certainly true. I mean, in a sense, not much has changed since the 1970s with respect to the idea that women's bodies are a distraction to the boys. This is a very commonly cited justification for dress codes in high schools. And there's really no doubt that most of the dress code enforcement is targeted at girls. That, uh, you know, in one high school, for instance, they actually rounded up about 200 students on the first day of school for dress code violations. You know, they wanted to make a statement, we're gonna really crack down and, and you've got to follow the dress code. 90% of the people they rounded up were girls. So um, I actually did some work with the DC, um, some girls in DC public schools who were complaining about the dress codes there. And, you know, again, almost all the enforcement targets girls, and it's the same arguments, you know, this, whatever it is, it can be yoga pants, it can be, you know, shorter skirts, or, or, or you know, tops that show the collarbones, um, distracting to the boys, and so you can't wear it. And it's quite troubling in many ways. You know, one, it's just a, an extra tax for the girls who might have to go home and change. Sometimes their parents had to come pick them up from school 
or some schools would make them wear, you know, kind of a garment of yes. shame. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's it's humiliating. Really, you know, to be to be called out and to then, you know, m maybe told your only option is to put on something that's, I think, in some cases, chosen to be demeaning yes. or silly looking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one school, and I know it's not the only one, actually made the uh, violators wear a day glow yellow shirt that said "dress code violator" on the front in big yeah. letters. Yeah. So you know, there's a public shaming aspect to it. Um, and so, you know, definitely that is still very much an issue. Um, with respect to people of color, it's also true that, uh, and in a couple ways, you know, one is that things that are considered to be unprofessional or, um, or, uh, you know, a problem because they signal, let's say, gang membership or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. or very often things that are favored by members of uh, minority groups. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in employment, the all braided hairstyle or locks are often described as unprofessional. Um, it may not be intentional, but based on a norm that doesn't include African-American women, these kinds mm -hmm. of dress codes then exclude styles that are quite common for African-American women and that are um, you know, good, healthy hairstyles for, for their texture right. of hair. Um, so, you know, all of these kind of things are an issue. And, you know, the last area where it comes up, and this one I'm a little bit more, um, I have mixed feelings about, because the last one where it comes up is schools in, um, you know, relatively poor communities, uh, heavily minority communities that are uh, trying to socialize the students into the norms of the mainstream workplace, mm -hmm. you know, they're aspirational. And sure. they may have the strictest dress codes of all. In many cases, the administrators are also of the same race as the students. So, you know, you'll have an African-American principal really enforcing a tough dress code on these African-American kids. Um, they are, in fact, being treated much more severely than their white counterparts at the school in another neighborhood. But the principal would say, you know, we need to teach these kids how to, you know, we, we, we want them to aspire to get out of the, this neighborhood and, and to get good jobs in other places. And so we, we want to make sure that they're prepared for the working world. And so that's kind of a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. I understand why the principals would do that, even though at the same time, it is still unfair to them. Yeah, kids. sure, sure. Can you speak to the difference between, or can you give a definition of dress code versus like a law? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, are you, did you treat those, would you consider those like two different things? Uh, well, yes, although the book deals with both. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons I deal with both is because they, um, there's a lot, not only is there a lot of overlap, but they're performing the same function in many instances. So um, there are relatively few laws that prohibit certain forms of dress in contemporary society. There are a few, there are laws about public indecency. There are some cities, for instance, that have outlawed sagging pants as, um, you know, they specifically named sagging pants as a form of public indecency. But for the most part, you know, we've gotten away from the kinds of sumptuary laws that used to regulate mm -hmm. clothing in an elaborate way. But we still have lots of expectations. Employers have dress codes and all those, though, although those are not laws, um, you'll lose your job if you don't comply with the dress code. Mm -hmm. So they do have real, um, real significance. And then there are the informal ones, which although they may not even be written, can be just as powerful because you can see that people will be judged and therefore have negative career consequences or mm -hmm. negative consequences in other areas if they you know, violate the unwritten dress code. Can you speak at all to um, jewelry trends, mimicking fashion trends like in the last century? Do you, you, know, do you know much about where jewelry figures into this history? Well, it does, and you know, there some of the early dress codes that I talk about actually uh, mention jewelry. So, sumptuary laws would regulate, uh, you know, the kind of jewelry people could wear. Um, acts of apparel, these things in the middle, late Middle Ages and Renaissance era, would regulate all of those types of things. Jewelry was a real target of religious prohibition in Renaissance era Italy. So the same people who 
you, uh, you know, we're responsible for the bonfires of the vanities where books were burned and art and things that were considered to be decadent. Jewelry was one of the things that were considered to be a vanity and particularly the vain woman who wears too much jewelry. Um, and, uh, you, uh, you know, not only is this um, self-regard, but it was also considered to be a kind of um, seductive um, inappropriately seductive mm -hmm. attire. So jewelry was, was, was heavily regulated. Oddly enough, at the same period of time, some cities had laws that actually required um, members of other religions to wear jewelry. Yes. So Jewish women were required to wear earrings mm -hmm. at the same time that Christian women were forbidden from wearing them. So they would, everyone would know on site that mm. the woman was Jewish. Um, now, of course, as you move forward, uh, you know, the flapper era, for instance, there was a lot of very dramatic jewelry that was part of uh, flapper fashions. And that was sometimes banned according to the same laws that were banning the, the slim skirts or the bobbed hair because part they all went together in kind of a fashion style and they were associated with flappers. Um, let me see if I can think of other examples involved in jewelry. Of course, well, Here's one more. Of course, in today's um, environment, there's a lot of piercing. Mm. You know, not all the uh, um, you know, men wear earrings. Um, lots of people have pierced noses, pierced uh, eyebrows, and the like. That's been the subject of a great deal of regulation. So many employers um, have dress codes prohibiting that kind of piercing. Maybe you know, some the more conservative places would limit um, all people to only one piercing per ear, and probably. Mm -hmm forbid men from wearing earrings at all, but all of the other types of piercings were seen as, or have been seen as somewhat, um, you know, controversial. Mm -hmm. Now, were some of the laws in terms of fashion about what you could, could should wear or could wear and not wear tied in the, tied to the economy in any way? For example, like favoring one particular industry or trade over another? Yes, there were. And indeed, some of the early what are called sumptuary laws, these laws that regulated um, flamboyant or, or um, you know, indulgent attire, um, were justified both as, um, you know, sometimes they were, they, they were tied to the balance of trade. So for instance, in the preamble of one of the acts of apparel, it talked about the, um, the, the the balance of trade and the fact that money was being you know channeled out of the realm and into foreign countries to bring these fashions in um, and so therefore targeted certain types of clothing that were more likely to be imported um, although in a lot of instances that seemed less important than the regulation according to status because sometimes the same laws would then say only, you know, therefore only a knight of the garter can wear the red silk. And so, you know, it's still being imported, mm -hmm. but it's the aristocracy. And I suppose the argument was at least that would limit the amount of this kind of clothing that was being imported. And there were certainly laws that favored, you know, domestic industries to try to channel people to buy um, clothing that was made domestically. There were also, uh, a claim was also made that the um, people were going into debt or um, ruining themselves financially, or even resorting to crime in order to keep up with the latest fashions. And so they were regulating the fashion for that reason, um, to protect uh, the lower orders, if you will, from their own poor judgment in terms of you know, spending their money and, and mm -hmm. to kind of clamp down on this sort of status competition. Someone else is asking, um, to what extent were men's fashions considered important household expenses while, um, while women's garments, you know, are considered more of an extravagance? You know, I, I think you can certainly make that argument. I, I, it, it appeared, it appears in this form, men's clothing after the great masculine renunciation. Um, men's clothing was understood to be practical. And so um, a man was not fashionable, he was well-dressed. And what was understood was that he wore only the level of clothing that was necessary in order to be respectable. Mm 
Now, that would then suggest that this is a necessary expenditure and not an indulgence, even if the man wears a very expensive tailored suit with you know, refined fabrics that requires a great deal of time and effort and money. Um, if it's appropriate to his status, it's a necessary expense. You would, you're just not dressed appropriately. Mm -hmm. Whereas women's clothing was always seen as flamboyant and kind of an indulgence, even though um, there were also etiquette guides that would certainly right. say the well-dressed woman must wear the following things. Right. So there, there was a way in which the, the, the symbolism around the clothing contributed to the idea that men were being practical and only buying what they needed, whereas women were always um, indulging themselves mm -hmm. in luxury. I think it's interesting too, just this idea of, you know, the, the word came up a lot in your, in your talk. And I know you see this theme throughout the book too, uh, of frivolity, you know, mm -hmm. frivolousness. Or when you mentioned like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's quote about uh, why would I, you know, I can't like waste my time what, on something like as silly as what I'm going to wear every day. And it, it brings me back to, I'm going to get a little less academic here. Um, the movie, uh, The Devil Wears Prada, oh, yes. about the fashion industry and how, you know, there's a moment in the movie where the, you know, the protagonist, she's kind of, she's working in the fashion industry, but sort of laughing at the people she works with and is reminded by them, you know, I know you think this is silly, but everything that you're wearing was mm -hmm. chosen for you by everybody in this room and you don't even know like how like big yeah. this is and she's reminded at another point in the movie by another character you live your life in this stuff that's you know that like it's not frivolous it's you know it's art and like one of the most important forms of art because you live your life in it so I just yeah. think it's interesting that we often want to put this like Oh, fashion, it's kind of silly, it's extravagant, it's, you know, but we're always coming back to it. And it's something that I think, I don't know why we don't want to admit it, but that, or why we kind of like to wear sometimes this badge of, oh, I don't care, or I don't understand it, as like, that makes me better. Um, but really, it is, it's, it's so, um, uh, important to understanding just how we live our our lives absolutely that's one of the points i really wanted to advance in the book and you know i certainly get a lot of people um in my profession in academia who would say you know it's silly it's frivolous why are you you know you're, you're writing a book about fashion um and, and you know don't you have something serious to do and um the number of people who would begin a question with well i don't know anything about fashion but right you know, in order to make sure that that's well established before they move on. Um, but indeed, fashion is, I would argue, it's one of the vehicles for expressing individual identity. Yes. And therefore, it was key to the development of the notion of the modern individual, that one of the things that happened with the birth of fashion, it went alongside a lot of cultural developments that led people to think of individuals as significant and as deserving of um, attention and respect. So not just, for instance, great kings or momentous right. events, but the, the average person is important. And they're expressing that in some sense through their clothing. So I think it's profoundly important. And it is why um, even people who say they don't care about fashion really do they you know even if it's just to say that they don't care about it it's a and and many of the things that appear to be unfashionable are very powerful fashion statements mm -hmm. you know that gray t-shirt yeah yeah that's very true um we're going to take a, just a couple more questions as we kind of come to the end of our time but i just want to remind folks um uh dress codes it's an excellent book and you can purchase it through our museum store I've shared the link in the chat, but the website is mainhistorystore.com. You can find that book. And if you haven't, a lot of the, uh, some of the examples of fashion that Professor Ford shared with us tonight, you can see some actual examples from Maine history in our exhibit, Northern Threads. If you haven't had a chance to visit 
yet, um, visit mainhistory.org and you can learn more about the exhibit and how you can purchase tickets. And um, you can also see we've got some other upcoming talks on this topic. Uh, Ned Lazaro is going to be with us from Historic Deerfield on June 1st to talk about silk. And we're doing another book talk that shares a lot of similarities um, with this book on June uh, 21st. Laura Edwards is going to be with us to talk about only the clothes on her back, clothing and the hidden history of power in the 19th century United States. So that should be a good one. So just a couple more questions for you. Can you speak at all to what precipitates uh, changes in dress length through the years? Why are they getting shorter or longer? <laughs> right. That's an interesting question. And um, people have Kind of struggled to, to answer that question for a long time. You know, there was an old theory that the hemlines went up and down with the stock market, but that's been pretty much debunked. <laughs> um, now, a few things though. Uh, women's fashion, especially since the flapper era, has kind of toggled back and forth between certain elements that are streamlined and modern and then other elements that are flamboyant and decorative and kind of harken back to earlier eras of women's clothing. And so what you see is this constant movement um, where, and the, and the hemlines reflect that. So you'll take something like uh, Christian Dior's new look that uh, came out in the 1940s. Well, here you have, um, on the one hand, it's a shorter skirt. So it's a type of skirt that would have been scandalous in the, um, 19th century because the legs are exposed, you know, absolutely forbidden, but it's a wide skirt. So unlike the flapper skirt, it's now wide again, which gives it a certain mm. you know, flamboyance, a certain extravagance, a certain glamour. Um, so the best answer that I can give is that fashion is always chasing something that's novel and striking, mm. but it has to also refer to something that's familiar. Mm -hmm. because otherwise we can't understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and so their fashion designers are borrowing from things in the, the past. You know, a, a wide skirt on a woman is a very, very old um, statement, but now it's gonna be a short skirt, which was a relatively novel statement and the two together give you something new. Um, so that movement of hemlines is all about giving us some new idea Mm -hmm. that at the same time is sufficiently familiar that we can understand it as feminine and that we can understand it as, um, you know, um, uh, desirable. So one more question for you. It's about the, the cover of the book. Um, and one individual says that seeing that image was specifically what caught her eye and she why she uh -huh. wanted to join this discussion. And it was one of, I thought, one of the more interesting things that I learned and took away from the book um, like where did the style of the high heel come from? Um, and, uh, you know, maybe can you talk a little bit about why you chose that image for the cover? Yes, yes. Well, that's a picture of Louis XIV in, you know, grand ceremonial dress. And it, the full image appears inside the book, but the, the, the book designer, I thought, did a brilliant job of picking that little fragment of it because you know, you can't, you, if, you, if you're familiar with the image, you might say, oh yeah, I know that image. I know that's Louis XIV. Otherwise you wouldn't know who it is. At first, mm -hmm. you might not even know whether it's a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. You have stockings and you have high heels um, that to, it, to our eye look feminine, but then you've got the sword. And then wait a minute, what's, what's going on with the sword? The high heels um, were originally a masculine fashion. Yeah. They were introduced to Europe by um, Persian horse riders and the heel would be used to stay in the stirrup. I, was just, I thought that was fascinating that that's where they come from. Yes, and, and so and it's one of these things where, um, so that's very, that was very virile, very masculine, very mm -hmm. sexy. And so men started to adopt it, but over time they became a status symbol. The heels got higher. Louis Couture's here is painting it red. Um, which makes them stand out even more. And um, red is already a high status color at the time. If you think about Christian Louboutin and the red sole yes. high heeled shoes, mm -hmm. it has to be a direct reference to this. I mean, I just can't believe that that's not where that idea came from. Mm -hmm. And, um, but over time, you know, fashion forward women, daring women started to wear these high heeled shoes too. 
um, they're immediately sexy because they're masculine and it's a woman wearing masculine fashion. That's a very old idea that you know, women wearing some element of men's clothing um, is sexy and erotic. And you know, then fashion takes its course. So that, but you know, by the 1800s, you have men who are ridiculing other men for wearing high heeled mm. shoes. This is the great masculine renunciation. It used to be okay to do that, but now you're laughable if you wear high heeled shoes. And so I believe it was Alexander, um, Alexander Pope, the poet said, um, you know, to people wearing high heels, go from among us and be tall if you can. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think it was a great, that's a good quote for us to, for, to close on this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ford. Yeah. This is a fascinating talk. I had a great time. I hope our audience Enjoy. enjoyed themselves. Um, anything else that you want to, to say um, before we close officially? Um, no, just thank you. Thanks again to the Bain Historical Society for inviting me. I really enjoyed the talk here. And um, if I get to Maine in time, I'm definitely going to come to this exhibit. Please, yeah, uh, please uh, let us know um, when you're in vacation land and we would love, we would love for you to come by. And um, thank you again, everyone for joining us. And if you haven't had a chance to visit Northern Threads yet, I hope we'll see you all real soon.